Ken Brockie's Evolver program produces minimal surfaces with given boundaries by moving points on the surface along the gradient field of the mean curvature function. Let's give the points on this catenoid a push to the right. We have made the process dynamic by interpreting that gradient as acceleration. Here's a top view of the same simulation. Here we have given an initial upwards velocity to the minimal surface on a tetrahedral frame. The vibrations are visible where the faces of the surface meet, but we would need other methods to see those on the rest of the surface. In this simulation of the dynamics of the minimal surface spanning a trefoil knot, a transparent red surface represents the endpoints of the field of velocity vectors. The surface itself is blue, so it appears purple where the velocity vectors are pointing towards the viewer. The vibrations seem to show some periodicity. This close-up shows how the triangulation of the surface constantly adjusts to keep all the triangles approximately the same size. This simulation uses the red velocity surface to show the vibrations of a Mobius strip. The initial velocity was towards the right. Here is the same simulation. The vibrating surface is shown in blue in reference to the fixed minimal surface shown in white. This catenoid was given a large initial velocity to the right. There's a lot of retriangulation going on. Wow, let's see that again. Now, a slow motion instant replay. The circulatory system forms a closed loop, distributing oxygen to the various tissues of the body and carrying carbon dioxide back to the lungs. The blood pumped by the left heart flows through the systemic circulation, delivering oxygen to the organs. Carbon dioxide is then carried through the systemic veins and pumped by the right heart into the pulmonary arteries. The carbon dioxide is exchanged for oxygen in the lungs. The oxygenated blood flows through the pulmonary veins to the left heart again. This diagram is based on a mathematical model of a steady state circulatory system. The volume proportions are illustrated by the amount of particles shown in each part of the system. Notice that the systemic veins hold the largest amount of the total blood volume. The pressure differences in the arteries and veins, as shown in the bar graphs, allow the blood to flow. In the steady state model, the flow rate is constant through the entire system. This represents a system in which the heart rate cannot change. In this model, if the systemic resistance were to be reduced, for instance when you exercise, the heart rate would not increase. Instead, the pressure in the systemic arteries would decline substantially with only a small increase in cardiac output. A new model can be derived by allowing the heart rate to vary. This represents a controlled system in which the body compensates for sudden variations. For example, when you exercise, your heart rate will go up in response to a reduction in the systemic resistance. This leads to an increase in cardiac output. The systemic arterial pressure is maintained, providing the body with its necessary blood supply. A more physiologically accurate model is developed by just making the heart rate a variable in the system.
Diving is a sport that clearly follows physical laws. These laws are simple enough so that diving can be analyzed by a computer. This summer I rode a diving simulator. My program simulates the diver as a rotating body moving under the influence of gravity. Its rotational speed is controlled by the diver's position. This control panel allows the user to select the direction of the dive and the height of the board. The Preferences panel controls the initial conditions of the dive, such as the height of the diver, the mass of the diver, and the takeoff angle. The Options panel controls the output of the program. The stick figure version of the program can be used to see exactly what happens during a dive. For instance, we can see that divers have to kick out of dives before they get to vertical because they are still rotating as they hit the water. That was a reverse two and a half tuck and this is an inward one and a half pike. Here is a back one and a half with one and a half twists. This is the same dive with a slight under twist. It illustrates a common problem with twisters. If a diver's twist is not perfectly square, any bend following the twist is not in the same plane as the rotation. Overtwisting is just as bad. The output of the diving program is fed into GeomView. This means that it is easy to rotate, translate, and zoom in and out of the picture. Here is a reverse two and a half in the tuck position. And this is an inward one and a half with one twist. The program can also create a 3D diver. We calculate the angular velocity at each frame by finding the moment of inertia of the diver and then following the law of conservation of angular momentum. The program figures out how flat a dive is and then sets a splash height. The splash then moves under the influence of gravity. That was an under-rotated front two and a half in the tuck position. Here is a back one and a half in the pike position. A dive is controlled by setting the time points at which the diver starts changing position. Oops! Let's fix this dive. The problem was that the diver kicked out of the pike too late, so we must change that time point to an earlier time. So, we will set the lineup time slightly earlier. Here is the corrected dive. Now, wasn't that better? A conformal map is a function from a complex domain to another which preserves angles. CR server is the program which produces conformal maps interactively. With a boundary curve like this, it computes a conformal map from the square to the interior of the boundary. If the boundary is drawn in the opposite direction, then it maps the square to the exterior of the boundary, i.e. the complement of the interior in the Riemann sphere. You can also draw a boundary with turning number n, here n is 2. Then CR server will wrap the square n times around branch points to find an analytic map, i.e. a conformal map except at branch point. If the turning number is minus 2, CR server will map the square to the outside of the curve. As the evolution continues, the picture begins to approximate the map g goes to 1 over g square. Here we zoom in for better look. Now click on the doubly periodic boundary condition which identifies the opposite size of the square. Now our map is defined on the torus. We tell CR server to evolve to a conformal map. 
Now, in fact, this is a picture of the Weisler's p function. The Weisler's p function is a meromorphic function on torus, which has one double pole. Notice the map has two layers, one on top of the other, except three branch points, and another branch point at infinity, which you cannot see here. Since we got the image of the Weisler's p function with the turning number minus two, let's see what we get with the turning number minus three. We first get a map from the square to the outside of the curve approximating the map g goes to one over g cubed. As before, choose the doubly periodic boundary condition and let the map evolve. Then you get a picture of the derivative of the Weisler's p function. This intuitively makes sense because the derivative of one over g square is a constant multiple of one over g cube. CR Solver is an interactive next program written in Objective C. Solsys View is an interactive solar system viewer. It can be used to visualize spacecraft trajectories. The interface consists of the main panel, which controls the flow of frames being displayed. The user can step through the frames using the VCR controls or let the frames play at a constant rate with the play button. The date panel displays the date and ship time corresponding to the frame being displayed. The camera control panel allows various viewpoints. and display of objects such as background stars, planet labels and highlighting boxes, and the spacecraft's path. The user can also zoom in and pan the camera around. This view is from 1.1 million kilometers above the ecliptic, looking down. Here is a view with the camera positioned on the spacecraft, looking back as the spacecraft leaves the Earth. Looking at other bodies from the spacecraft is also useful, as can be seen in this flyby of the moon. Here is a lunar capture sequence seen from the Earth. Solsys view was written in C on a silicon graphics iris workstation. The trajectory data was computed using software furnished by Dr. Edward Belbruno of Innovative Orbit Design Incorporated. Dr. Belbruno also provided consultation for this project. The capability also exists to texture map onto the planet's surface. Here we see Mars with data from the Viking spacecraft overlaid on the surface. The camera is attached to the spacecraft, which is moving past Mars below the South Pole. The picture on the left is an image produced by Solsys View using Mars Observer trajectory data calculated for 3.52 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, July 27, 1993. The picture on the right is an actual photograph taken by the Mars Observer spacecraft at that point in time. It's difficult to appreciate the complexity of clouds as they pass overhead. However, trying to generate them by computer really puts things in perspective. 
Perhaps the best method for generating clouds is to use a fractal technique known as spectral synthesis, or Fourier filtering. The method uses an array of complex coefficients based globally on dimension, locally on frequency, and multiplied by a Gaussian random number. The array is then run through an inverse Fourier transform, generating an array of real numbers. These numbers are then interpreted as intensities. The blue background is made up of those values which are less than the median value. The clouds appear smooth when the fractal dimension of the clouds is 2. As we increase the dimension towards 3, the clouds become more jagged. This is done by altering the distribution of the coefficients in the original array. The most realistic looking clouds are about dimension 2.6 or dimension 2.7. But of course, real clouds move in the sky. So how can realistic motion be simulated? One way is to multiply each coefficient by e to the negative i theta, where theta is an angle in two-dimensional coefficient space. Theta has to vary with frequency because the higher frequencies must be rotated more than the lower frequencies in order to move the same physical distance. If we use theta as a bound for a random function, then the clouds move realistically across the sky. For my summer project here at the Geometry Center, I studied meanders and simple alternating transit mazes. A maze is transit if it has only one path, alternating if the path switches directions as it changes levels, and simple if the path travels on each level just once. Each simple alternating transit maze can be represented by the sequence in which its levels are traversed. A meander is another representation of the sequence, with the numbers indicating the pattern with which a curve crosses a line. As part of my study, I created a next interface which illustrates simple alternating transit mazes and meanders from their integer sequences. The user inputs a sequence and the number of integers in the sequence. With these inputs, the sequence may then be checked to see if it is a valid meander sequence. If the sequence passes the test, it can be viewed as either a meander or a maze. There are too many tests performed when the user clicks on the testing button for them all to be explained here in detail, but the user can often see what is wrong with the pattern by examining its meander. This seemingly acceptable pattern does not pass the test. A click of the meander button reveals that this path does cross itself. Now that the interface has been explained, we can take a look at some mazes of interest. Roman mosaic mazes were simple alternating transit mazes or combinations of such mazes. Here is the most frequently occurring pattern among the cataloged mazes. Other commonly found Roman mosaic patterns can be formed by adding on to this sequence. This is the second most frequently found pattern. A similar addition would give us the third most common type. This maze has not been found in any Roman mosaics, but I find it to be of interest. Although relatively few meander patterns have been found among the Roman mosaics, the number of meander patterns for a given size n grows approximately as 3.5 to the nth power. There are almost a million meander sequences of just 19 numbers. Most of the numbers of possible sequences are known for mazes with fewer than 30 rows, but there exists no explicit formula for calculating these numbers. Much of my research this summer went to trying to create a better counting algorithm. This was unsuccessful, but my work is bound to continue in the future. The BRAT program, created by Linus Upson for Next Computers, is able to display slices of fractal objects, such as these from the cubic connectedness locus. Like the Mandelbrot said, the cubic connectedness locus can be generated by the iteration of a complex function over its parameter space. Both objects are also defined as those points in the parameter space whose Julia sets are connected. 
Because the function that is used to compute the cubic connectedness locus, z cubed minus 3a squared z plus b, has two complex parameters, the object exists in a four-dimensional space. The new interfaces and the modifications of the BROT program permit better visualization of this four-dimensional object. It is now possible to interactively specify the zoom size and the slice selection. A slice projection panel was created to reference the selected slice. The slice may be altered by clicking and dragging on either axis or the origin. Finally, it is now possible to specify a succession of planar slices which may be animated or saved to make video frames. These animations display six of the 12 different ways to orient and translate a planar slice along the four coordinate axes. This summer, I created an application for Iris Computers to show how binary trees can be used in computer graphics. They are useful for correctly drawing transparent surfaces and are also used in ray tracers, algorithms which draw pictures by sending out rays of light from the eye and calculating what they hit. Let's start with a two-dimensional case. Given a number of line segments, we can place them in a binary tree according to position. We extend the first line segment into a line and make it into the first entry in our tree. Then, for the next line segment, we can determine whether it is to the right or the left of the first one and place it in the tree accordingly. We extend this line segment until it meets the first extension. We repeat this process for the other segments. If a line segment lies on both sides of an extension, we just divide the segment into two pieces and place each piece in the tree separately. We wind up with a partitioning of space, where each terminal node of the tree corresponds to exactly one sector of space. Points in the same sector see the line segments in the same relative position. If one sees the red in front of the blue, so will the other. We can use the same method to view polygons in three dimensions. In this case, the line segments become squares and the line extensions become semi-transparent planar extensions. To know what a viewer would see, a first step is to know what region it's in. We record this by placing an eye at the corresponding node of the tree. In this demonstration, the middle window shows what the eye sees. As we rotate the world, the relative position of the eye changes, and this is reflected in the changing position of the eye 
in the tree. The tree structure is useful for drawing transparencies correctly because whenever you want to show a semi-transparent object, the object seen through it must be drawn first. For each position, the tree tells us the drawing order of the polygons as seen from that point. A good drawing program ignores parts of the world that are hidden by things in front of them. This is one of the features of a ray tracing program. It sends out rays of light in every direction and uses the tree to follow each ray and see what it hits. In this case, a ray straight into the center of the picture checks the green plane and records a miss. It hits the red. After the world has moved, we send out another ray. This time, the algorithm checks the green and records a pass through the transparent part. It then repositions the eye on the other side of the green and then checks the yellow and records a hit. Here we have rotated the same set of polygons. To create the image seen by the eye, we send out many rays in an angular sector and display what they hit. Here I have chosen a 60 degree viewing angle and I'm sending out 10,000 evenly spaced light rays. The final image appears on the right. This summer, Tim Rowley and I worked on Olaf Holtz and Darren Meyer's film that will explain to a general audience how to visualize four-dimensional objects. Our scene introduces the concept of representing objects in one less dimension by using color. The example we use shows a two-dimensional way of representing a three-dimensional map of part of Alaska. Here is our scene as it will be shown in the film. Let's look at an easier case. Let's look at three-dimensional objects in two dimensions. First thing we need is our two dimensions. Those are length and width. We do this every day when we draw pictures. Here, we're representing a three-dimensional head by a two-dimensional smiley face. In more complex pictures, light, color, and perspective help us represent three dimensions. Here, we have a two-dimensional map of Alaska where color represents height, blue represents water, up until the white peaks of the highest mountains. You can see this correlation a little bit easier as our mountains grow. Now, sit back and enjoy as we take you through a scenic tour of Alaska. the exception of those of us fortunate enough to have perfect pitch, it is difficult for the average untrained ear to immediately distinguish between the various keys a musical piece can have. It would then be very useful to create a program that could help people visualize the tonality of music. Russian composer Alexander Scriabin had the idea of a color keyboard where the keys are represented by different colors. I decided to use this idea and animate it. I began working from already existent score files. This is the score file for the Moonlight Sonata.
I took a group of notes and picked out chords. For example, here is the C sharp E G sharp chord. Upon a match, each of the 24 keys is assigned a value, shown on the bottom, depending on which chord C sharp E G sharp represents for that key. 10 if it's the tonic, 8 if it's the dominant, and so on. The same process is repeated through the entire piece. I maintain a running total for each key of the values from the last 25 entries in the score file. Once the total reaches 100 points, I am ready to conclude that the piece is in that key at this time. Now, connect the algorithm to the next interface builder. Voila, you can see the Moonlight Sonata. You are looking at 2D slices of the escape rate locus for various members of the complex Hinnan family. This locus is a set of points which escape to infinity at the same rate forward and backward. Right now we are looking at an area around zero in the real plane, having set the variables to be real numbers. The points in these pictures are colored by distance to the locus, with lighter points being closer and darker points further away. Each picture represents a different set of parameters. As you can see, different parameters will create different loci. Some parameters will create a relatively simple locus, while others will create a more complicated one. In a moment, we will select a set of parameters for which the locus is complicated on the real plane and attempt to visualize a 3D slice by walking down the imaginary x-axis. Now we'll move on to a blow-up of a particularly interesting section of the last locus. My project was to write a drawing program which draws on the surface of a sphere. This is the panel which controls sphere scribble. It is used to select drawing tools such as the scribble tool, motion modes, and various other settings such as colors and line widths. Drawing on the surface of a sphere is quite different from drawing on the plane due to the sphere's curvature. One obvious difference is that geodesics are curved. Another difference is how things move on the sphere. When the blue line is moved around the triangle, it twists to follow the curvature. As it moves along an edge, the angle between the line and the edge remains constant. However, the line has been rotated by 90 degrees by the time it goes all the way around the triangle. Because the sphere has total curvature 1, the amount the line was rotated is equal to the curvature enclosed inside the triangle. But what happens when we move around a curve which is not made of geodesics? The L appears to twist as it moves. As with the triangle, the total rotation is equal to the enclosed curvature. If we traverse the path in the opposite direction, the shape rotates backwards. So by the time we've gone all the way around in the other direction, 
the L should be right back where it started. Despite these odd effects due to curvature, we can draw on the sphere much as on the plane. Notice that small objects appear almost as they do on the plane. This is because a small piece of sphere is almost flat. Sphere scribble allows us to zoom in to draw small pictures, such as this small star. We can also draw polygons. This big square looks very different from a planar square since its angles are far bigger than 90 degrees and its sides bulge out. Finally, let's draw normal vectors, lines sticking straight out of the sphere. As we rotate the sphere, we can see that these straight lines act quite differently from the curved lines on the sphere. Sphere Scribble was implemented on a Silicon Graphics Iris workstation in C using GL and the Forms Library. The original motivation for Sphere Scribble was a request for a program to produce illustrations for a spherical geometry text. For this reason, Sphere Scribble can produce output in PostScript, a page description language used by printers, as well as in its own format. Being able to draw interactively on a sphere is useful for developing intuition about spherical geometry. After all, we live on the surface of a spherical planet, not in a giant piece of paper. Given the Riemann surface, the complex structure determines the notion of angle on the surface. In other words, it determines a conformal geometry on the surface. The theory of Teichmuller spaces deals with the various geometries that can be put on any specific topological surface. The Teichmuller space of a genus 1 surface, one that is topologically the torus, is precisely the upper half plane. One can then ask the question, what do these different geometries look like? One way to see this is to construct conformal embeddings of the surfaces in R3. This program uses a numerical algorithm to approximate a conformal map from the Riemann surface to R3. The user can enter the complex number characterizing the surface, the major and minor radii of the initial map, and the grid size used in the approximation. In these examples, we have selected the complex number i so this Riemann surface comes from a unit square with the opposite sides identified. We have also chosen a variety of initial maps. Now, using the numerical algorithm, the initial embedding is evolved. As it gets closer to being conformal, we should expect the rectangles, which are the images of the squares of the grid, to become squares also. And this is precisely what we see in this torus.
This summer I added several new features to LinkTool, a knot processing and displaying program written at the Geometry Center. LinkTool can now handle knots and links with self-intersections. On the projection of the figure 8 knot seen here, such singularities correspond to double points. The chord diagram of a knot symbolizes with its chords the order in which the self-intersections can be found. Here is the chord diagram for the figure 8 knot with four double points. These diagrams are useful when calculating the Vassiliev invariance. Vassiliev invariants give a new way of classifying knots. They are similar to knot polynomials, but to use them one has to consider knots with singularities. Here the program calculates the invariance up to order 5 of the two knots with 5 crossings. The knot 5, 1 has a first order invariant equal to 3. Here is a knot 5, 2. It has a first order invariant equal to 2. So, the first order invariant already distinguishes them. I have also given LinkTool the ability to do the Reitermeister 1 and 2 moves. Reitermeister moves on a knot projection correspond to deformations which leave the knot unchanged. Two Reitermeister 1 moves show how this knot projection is equivalent to the common left trefoil projection. After a Reitermeister 2 move, we see that this six-crossing projection is actually another projection of the figure 8 knot. Because I am entering this projection layer by layer, it represents the unknot. In fact, a series of Reitermeister 1 and 2 moves get rid of all of the crossings. I spent my summer at the Geometry Center creating the Teichmuller Navigator as an interactive application on the Next. The program begins by giving the user a tiling of the hyperbolic plane with regular octagons. This tiling corresponds to a particular Riemann surface, or, in other words, to a surface with a particular geometry upon it. In the case of the octagon, our surface will be a two-hole torus. You can visualize this if you imagine gluing together the edges of the octagon. We can move to a different tiling by selecting an arbitrary vertex and pulling it to a new location in the unit disk. When we release the vertex, the program will evolve the other seven vertices into the nearest configuration that will tile hyperbolic space. This new tiling will also correspond to a two-hole torus, with some new geometry upon it. It may be the same surface as our original, if the tiling has been rotated or translated, or if certain other conditions are true. However, it may also represent a completely different Riemann surface, still a two-hole torus, but perhaps stretched out in some direction, or bent, or twisted. The space of all different geometries on a genus 2 surface is its Teichmuller space. So in moving around to different tilings, we are moving around in the Teichmuller space of the two-hole torus. Playing around with the navigator, we can come across some very strange octagons that will tile hyperbolically. 
We can even approach the boundaries of Teichmuller space with octagons that approach degenerate cases. Here we see that the vertices are being pulled to the boundary of the hyperbolic plane, which will eventually cause the evolved polygon to be untileable, or in other terms, not a Riemann surface. You can imagine that this might be a two-hole torus where one of the handles has been pinched to a point somewhere and then pulled apart. Hopefully, in the future, we will have a means to see what the surfaces that correspond to these tilings actually look like as embeddings in three dimensions, so that we can see how they are changing as we tweak and shift the tiling. But for now, we'll be content with moving around the hyperbolic tilings that represent the Teichmuller space of the two-hole torus and seeing what interesting things we can find there. Part of my summer's project was to animate the web construction ritual of Araneus diadematus, also known as the garden cross spider. The web of Araneus is elastic, vertically oriented, essentially two-dimensional, and roughly round in shape. The construction ritual can be stereotyped as follows. The spider begins by placing a bridge of a silken thread between two high points. It then travels back and forth between these two points several times, attaching an additional thread each time. Eventually, it will move to the center of the bridge, hook a new thread to a loose bridge thread, and lower itself to make a bottom attachment. The three initial radials have now been made in the classic Y formation. Often, the construction of the bridge and its first radials is followed by the creation of a second bridge. The spider then completes the frame of the web, adding anchors whenever necessary. Web weaving spiders are among the most interesting members of the animal kingdom. Approximately half of the 35,000 known spiders spin webs of ver wide varying geometric design. Of those that spin webs, approximately one third spin orb webs like Araneus. Of all the designs for webs, no structure is more organized, familiar, impressive, or beautiful than that of the orb. Like many orb weavers, the Araneus builds a new web each day, usually in the early morning hours. Before building the new web, the spider clears away the previous day's web. Many spiders, including Araneus, do not simply remove the previous day's web, but also carefully eat what remains. It then reconverts the old web into silk for the new web. The Araneus diadematus can reconvert as much as 97% of what it consumes in this way. The spider repeatedly circles around the hub. When encircling and encounters a gap between two radials that it judges to be too large, it climbs out along the higher of the two radials which border the gap, trailing a new thread behind. Then it climbs down the frame, attaches the trailing thread, and proceeds inward along the newly formed radial to the hub. Notice how the elastic threads of the web bend due to the mass of the spider. The process continues until the spider no longer finds a gap large enough to necessitate a new radial. Each new radial is built in three to five seconds, and the, all the radial and structural elements can be accomplished in under five minutes. Once no new radials are necessary, our Aeneas diadematus spins the temporary or provisional spiral. The temporary spiral contains a total of four to eight complete turns. Note that the distance between successive loops grows progressively larger. After completion of the temporary spiral, the spider pauses to change from production of the non-sticky thread to the viscid thread of the permanent or capture spiral. It can reverse its direction of movement several times during construction of the spiral to accommodate the shape of the frame of the web. While building this spiral, the spider simultaneously eats the temporary spiral. The permanent spiral is much more closely spaced than the temporary spiral. The spider stops building short of the hub, but continues to eat away the temporary spiral, thereby leaving the characteristic free zone where only radials exist. Finally, the spider bites out the center of the hub, and the web is complete. The entire process of spinning the permanent spiral takes a total of about 20 minutes. My project this summer was a program for displaying networks of anatomically realistic neurons. 
Here we see a neuron displayed with coordinate axes and a label indicating the distance of the soma from the origin. Different views can be obtained by rotation, translation, and zooming the camera in and out. Now we see voltage traveling through the neuron. The colors represent voltages according to the scale you see on the left side of the screen. The voltage sequence you are seeing was computed on a CM5 based on the physical properties of the neuron. The sequence shows the neurons transmitting pulses as voltage enters the soma in spikes. Here we see two different neurons displayed to scale. The larger one is a human hippocampal neuron and the smaller one is a mud puppy neuron. The shapes you see on the screen are created by observing actual neurons through microscopes. The only difference between the neurons on the screen and the real neurons is that here the long axons have been deleted for size considerations and clarity. These two neurons will go through the same voltage sequence, but the lower one will be one hundredth of a millisecond ahead of the upper one. Notice how the voltage spikes and pulses begin in the lower neuron just before they begin in the upper one. Here is the connection mode. In this mode, the neurons can be connected into networks. Notice that both neurons have turned black, except for the somas, which are blue and yellow. Color no longer indicates voltage as it did in the comparative mode. Now the color is simply used as an indicator to tell the neurons apart. We can now choose to make a connection. The upper synapse is blue, indicating it came from the blue neuron to the yellow one. Likewise, the lower synapse is yellow, indicating it came from the yellow neuron. We can also load previously created networks. There are two ways of displaying synapses. Here, as before, the color of the synapse indicates the neuron it is coming from. Now the synapse color indicates connection strength. The red synapses are the strongest, while the dark blue are the weakest. Now we can examine the network in three dimensions. Finally, here is a network of five neurons. Notice the fan shape where one compartment is connected to two adjacent neurons. Now let's take a closer look.